You're listening to the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Podcast, a podcast about Lynchburg sports. Press record, just go. Okay. Alrighty, we are here with Lynchburg's three national championship coaches. Really high expectations for this podcast. I was losing sleep about having you three in here uh, for the last couple days, but it's just really special to have all of our national championship coaches in one room facilitate a little discussion here. We have Philip Williamson, a two-time national championship coach, Lucas Jones coming off the championship last year with the baseball team, and Todd Olson, the national championship coach from 2014. So, coach, since yours was 10 years ago, we're going to get started, you know, really celebrating the 10-year anniversary of this national championship. Can you tell me about how 10 years after the fact, that national championship may still be affecting the program you have with the women's soccer team. Well, first, thanks for bringing it up that it's been 10 whole years since we won that. So that, <laughs> that makes me feel really good with these other guys in here that are fairly recent winners. Um, it just raised the expectation um, just to an extreme level, and, and, and that's good and bad. It, it created you know tremendous pressure. Um, when you get to that point, there's not a lot of ways to go. And, um, and it's tough, you know, Lynchburg's a, a, a wonderful school, a beautiful, you know, institution, but it's tough to win here and to do, be a consistent winner, and that is very, you know, it's, a, it's very difficult. I think in some ways it helped raise the level in the ODAC. I think our conference is way better than it was 10 years ago, and, and it's, but that's created a whole other challenge for recruiting and, and everything else. But just the whole expectation, it was, you know, it was an awesome experience, but it, it definitely put some pressure on me as a coach to try to repeat, and, and again, thanks for bringing it to my attention that I have not done that yet. <laughs> well, I bring it up, you know, 10 is a, is a nice number, you know, a reunion and Hall of, the players are going to start being Hall of Fame eligible. So kind of in that vein, tell me some of the positives about winning a national championship. The positives, no, they're all positive, truly. Um, it, it just was good because it's sort of a culmination of just incredible hard work. And, you know, we started the program when I first came, and, and it, it, you know, it was just okay. And, and it was really... You know, I can remember my, my third year with my assistant. I said, if we don't win next year, we're leaving. Uh-huh. And I'm not going to stay here because I, I didn't feel like I could win here. And we brought in, you know, 14 freshmen that year, and we won the ODAC for the first time. And then I couldn't leave after that. So, you know, we realized that, you know, with hard work and some luck, um, you know, we could progress towards that championship opportunity. And, and then that year just was magical. And, and it just reminds me, you know, when I think about, you know, watching – NFC and AFC championship games and I think about how magical it is to get a, the right guys or the right girls together to have them move towards a goal and, and with some luck you know some sweat some hard work you know being able to achieve something that's pretty you know for me it was life changing in that mm-hmm. you know it was an accomplishment and, and after that you look in the mirror and you're like well I don't have a whole lot to prove anymore I, I'm obviously okay at this at this business maybe it was the right choice to, to coach. So, Lucas, we'll move to you now. You know, almost famous, famously hearing your Hall of Fame speech when the team was introduced, you talked about how you told Travis Beasley, your associate head coach at the time, who's now the head coach of the team, if he comes to Lynchburg with you, if you go to your alma mater, you're going to win a national championship. Can you tell me about how that, that plan laid out when you first got here and how much did that line up to actually winning the whole thing? Well, truly, not just because Colt Joseph's sitting here, but I think that 2014 women's soccer team set the precedent, too. And you mentioned, you know, the heightened, you know, success of the conference over the last 10 years after they won it and how he's seen that improvement. But I think also as a, as a college at the time and now university, I think that standard of this can happen here at Lynchburg was, was kind of that – hallmark for us I mean especially early on showing kids around campus and walking them around and stopping and highlighting their national championship team because it coincided with you know our desire to get to that level and you know ultimately again win it and so I think you know being a student athlete here and watching the women's soccer program in 2004 2005 2006 and they were really during that time, they had some some really talented women on that team that I am still close with, and they've married some of my uh, teammates. And so we've we've kind of talked about those days and 
really I think it would be interesting to talk more with him about that growth because I saw kind of in that program and that, that time of them building up, right, they may have not necessarily gotten to that level yet, but I think those teams helped inspire that. And so when we got here, I think that was kind of the same mantra of, hey, early on it may not necessarily match on the field with what we want, but it's building that culture. It's, it's finding the right athletes that, again, coincide with your vision. And, you know, it started with the coaching staff sharing that vision, being able to put things in place and a standard in place. And then, you know, again, having the right guys early on that we inherited that would carry the culture and help us develop that. And then ultimately getting the, you know, the talented players in here to help us um, both on and off the field get to that level. So it really was simple. It was a shared vision. But honestly, it started because there was kind of that hope of, hey, this can happen here at Lynchburg because they were able to do that in, in 2014. So now we'll move to Philip with the equestrian program, talking about a, a vision. You go out and you win it in your early on in your career here at Lynchburg, but then you, you're able to follow it up and win it the, the following year. So we go back to hearing Olsen talk about those expectations that winning a national championship can provide to a team in a good or a bad way. What challenges did you and your program face after winning that first one? And can you talk about overcoming those challenges to be able to repeat as the best team in the country? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, our, our sort of path to championships is a little simpler than some of the, the other NCAA tournaments, which gives us a, a little bit of an advantage in our ability to get there. Obviously, we still have to do the work once we get there, but um, I think for us, we're lucky in that the program is not new, but sort of went through a little bit of a renaissance, if you will, in the last four years, and that I, which is rather unheard of, got to keep my entire starting roster from the first year to the second year, except for one student. So I really had all the kids that had done it the year before, been there, gone through it, some of them, all of them for the first time, right, all experienced that, and then had that both competitive advantage of having done it, but also mentally they were a year older, they were more experienced, they had that. So we weren't going sort of into it with like a whole new group of students or even half of a new group of students because of um, sort of where the team was at and, and where our, our student athletes were in terms of their how long they'd been with us. And so I think that helped immensely for us to feel like we were going into that second year with um, – just experience about having done it. And then I think too, there is there's a huge amount of pressure with doing it and, and going back and trying to do it again and trying to make it happen again. Um, but I think at the same time, we focused a lot throughout the whole year that that championship win, as exciting as it was, was not what defined our success as a team from the year before. We were successful, and people thought of us as successful because of the championship, but there were a lot of things that we had done that year before that made us successful. And so we focused on those same things the next year, and we hoped they were going to end up with us in the same situation, but we kind of had had goals that were not winning the championship to make sure that if we didn't quite get that far, or if we didn't get there because of the luck that is inherent to all of what we do, if, we, if something didn't quite go our way, that we were going to still have something to feel successful about, which I think helped a lot with dealing with some of that pressure and that um, the anxiety that comes from, oh, we just did this, everybody's going to expect us to do it again, what happens if we fall short? Well, you know, the, the anxieties and the pressure, it brings me to my next question that all three of you, it, in a good and a bad way, had really an interesting experience within that final game in your national championship. Also in your game, your match goes to shootouts, goes to PKs. Uh, <laughs> it looks like you're still wearing some of the stress from that game, <laughs> Lucas, but your game, you know, game three with the number one team in the country, uh, final score was seven to six. And then Philip in that second national championship, you know, the final score is four to four, and it goes to raw score tiebreak. Uh, can you tell me about the moments before finding out that raw score? What was going through your head about, you know, how the season was going to come to an end? Yeah, so I think for us, not it, not that it's unlike other sports, but for us, our athletes are judged on their performance and then compared to another rider, right? So there's no 
way to kind of make up for something you didn't do as well. You just have to wait and see if the other, the person you're riding against made the same mistake or not. And so there's, we can only control our half of it, right? And I think we started, we finished the first half of the championship meet down three to one. And so we knew, and we all knew that it was going to be really, really hard for us to come back from that. Tying was the best chance we were going to have, which would have meant we had to, that was in the fences event. So in the flat event, we needed to go three, one for us in the flat event, which is a lot of pressure for the kids to be under. Um, we kind of, we knew that we recognized that the raw score tie rig is always a hard thing but one of the things that we've always prioritized which i think for any but any coach you're going to is if you're not if you're not winning you're only losing by a little is mm -hmm. is our goal right like we don't if we're not going to win that day we want to know that we were close and so all of our kids in that fences event that three one deficit we were at they were all losing those points by two or three on the raw score so we were still really really close mm -hmm. if it came down to the raw score and we knew that so we knew that if we could win the points we'd probably be fine on the raw score because when we were winning our points we were beating sweetbriar by 10 points or by eight points or we were so we were ahead almost on the raw score even though we were at the deficit on the points and so we knew that going in and we just I mean we said to all the kids the, the thing we said before the second half is you just need to go in and be proud of how you ride if we win the point great if you don't that's okay but the goal right now is to go in and feel like we rode as best we could we're proud of what we did and we'll see where everything ends up um, and we did kind of know once we got it came down to the very last point of that second half the very last ride of the meet our rider Fallon Bel Castro had already ridden so we were just waiting on the sweet Briar rider for her score to come in and see if we were higher or lower and that was going to decide if it went to raw score or if we lost five to three it came in lower so we knew it went to raw score as soon as it went to raw score we knew we were going to be higher on the raw score so it was a very exciting moment it was a surprising moment i think for all of us because i think a lot of the girls kind of i don't know that they wrote off that it was possible but i think we were all we kind of all knew that like this was it, 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 we were going to get lucky if we got there um and we did but i think that having it that tight i think also in, in my opinion is something that you enjoy out of that level of competition and I think with the athletes that are in that situation and that are capable of doing or competing at the level that you have to to win a national championship they usually thrive off of that level of pressure that comes when it's that close and it makes them better mm -hmm. in that moment I think when they know they have to fight for it rather than when it's a regular season game or meet or whatever and we know we're going to win by a landslide so we're just going to go have fun and play where in that situation they they get pushed a little bit which i think is what helped honestly in the end is that that kind of lit a fire for each of them knowing that they had to work that hard and and they stepped up up to that so philip your team was able to come back and win uh but throughout the equestrian tournament you know you have to win to advance survive in advance a loss and it's over Lucas, it, it's unique in the fact that a couple hours before winning the national championship, your team lost a game. Can you talk about what you had to do or what the vibes were like as you try to rally a group coming off of a loss and you have to roll it back out there with one final shot to win? Yeah, well, first, if I look disheveled in my defense, I always look this way. <laughs> so it is not rolled over from June the 8th or whenever that – Final you, you game just was. You cringed at me when I when I set up the <laughs> questions and maybe it just too tough. I'm sorry. No, no, I uh, I just look this way all the time, Tim. So I'll take that as a compliment from you. But um, yeah, I, I don't. I, it's game 55 and 56 at that point. So I don't know if we necessarily were sitting there trying to rack our brain on how to get guys motivated to play. Mm -hmm. You know, the final game of the year. I don't know if we really ever processed that because it was a quick turnaround you know, between game two and game three there on that final day. And every game is unique in that sense. And we've played a lot of baseball over time, especially in our league, where we have doubleheader uh, conference situations that every game plays out differently, right? We might molly -wop a team in game one. It might be a tight game in game one. And the, the second game is totally different, right? Everything changes. And so it's kind of its own unique story. So I think going into the final game, it was more just the, the fact of, you know, where we saw ourselves athletically, you know, at that point in the season. Um, 
had a pretty good matchup with with being able to put Batch on the mound. Um, I agree with Philip. I think our players, you know, kind of raise to their level, you know, in those pressure situations. If you have kind of that right athlete and you've been building and building and building. Now, what I will disagree as a coach, I would love that 15 nothing game <laughs> where it doesn't, because it doesn't bring out the best in me when it's tight. Um, but for our players, absolutely. And I think they knew, you know, baseball is a game of threes and fives. And it's interesting how that game played out because. Um, obviously, Hopkins got on us for nothing in the first, so you kind of clip that three. You know, you don't want to ever be down by three, but then the next step is you don't want to be down by five. So I kept telling myself, like, all right, we're right there. We were able to cut the lead in half there in the bottom of the first to kind of ease the tension because they swung the bat well in, in, in game two. And um, you just a little fearful that they're going to carry that momentum. And they obviously did, but mm -hmm. at the same time, we were able to kind of diffuse those situations and um, keep the game close. And uh, we never got down by five, and then we never got down by three again. So the, the ability to, again, come back in that game, again, shows where our players kind of were, um, you know, at that point in the season, understanding that, you know, it, it does have to fall in line. You're going to have to gut it out. You're going to have to be tired. You're going to have to uh, go in the last nine outs. And well, essentially, that's kind of how that game, you know, played itself out in the end. And then, Coach Olson, you lose the National Player of the Year, you know, leading up to that national championship game. Can you talk about the preparation with your team where you're, you're playing for the for it all and, and the odds may have not shaken out the way that it looked like when that 64 team field began a couple weeks ago? Talk about having to overcome those pressures and then to go through shootouts, what your emotions were in that situation. Yeah, the, the, the interesting thing is that when we went to Messiah, you know, we, we played them in the final eight. And prior to that game, Angela Bosco was injured and she was a 30 goal scorer, a top player. You know, it's, I think the score was two to nothing. As a coach, I probably should have had her out of the game, you know, with two minutes left. And, and she took a shot, tore ACL. So we went into that next game against Messiah. Um, and, and the challenge there was you didn't have your best player. Mm -hmm. and, and so that night we're just racking our brain because we knew she'd torn her ACL, we knew she was out. And, and what we'd done with that team, and it was all about, the fascinating thing about that team was they were so tight and they were playing for each other the whole time. And that was a culture we tried to build for a long time that, hey, we're not playing, you know, as a team, we're playing for each other, literally. And when they saw Angela on the sideline, you know, I, I think it was literally – you know, there's a magical moment, and they just, you know, we ended up, we were down one nothing against Messiah, and, you know, with four minutes left, Jen Snyder, who hadn't scored a goal in her career, comes up and gets a header and, and ties it, and everybody looked to Angela, like, that was amazing, everybody went to the bench, and they were hugging her when we made that, and, and then we went to penalty kicks, and, and that's, you know, there's, penalty kicks are rough, you know, there's mm -hmm. not a lot of, there's not a lot you can do as a coach, you, you've prepared a little bit, but it's really, you know, do the kids step up and, you know, can they handle the pressure and, and do what they need to do? And, and they did. And then the fascinating thing, we get to the, the final four, and, and Angela was such a strong girl that the um, physical therapist allowed her to play. And so she played in that national championship, in the semifinal and the final with a torn ACL, scored a goal in the semifinal um, to help us advance to the championship game. And then in that championship game, she played 90 minutes plus the overtime. And then the, the, the really cool thing about the overtime is we, we go to penalty kicks and we had the same kickers. And, and we, you know, you talk about that as a coach, you know, do you change it up, do you mix it up? And we decided, hey, they got us here. These are kids that, you know, obviously could handle the pressure. And, and the other coach at Williams had seen the film. They knew exactly where we were going. So we had those five players and then they, they did a little mix. They changed players, so they they had gone with a different lineup, and, and the two kids that they added both missed, and then our kids that had already kicked, the coach knew they were literally pointing in a direction mm -hmm. that they knew where they were going to go, and every one of them um, put the ball in the back of that scored. So you know, I, I don't know. The pressure of that is pretty extraordinary, and I try not to. I, I don't even know how to remember it because it was, you know, I just remember. You're just so helpless because you're watching, and, and then you're now you're watching the other coach pointing, and they know where you're going to go, and and then for your kids to to rise above that and and still be able to perform. So I mean, it's just pretty extraordinary. And again, I just think it goes back to a culture that was built about, you know, they played their best, and and, and it, you know, I know what I said. 
before the kicks, you know, we love you, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You know, you've done everything you can do now, just, you know, do the best you can and, you know, whatever happens, we're gonna support you either way. And and that was the culture and so I think, you know, we were able to, to score those goals and, and do what we had to do and, and it was pretty exhilarating once, you know, especially the the challenge of penalty kicks are just it's a horrible way to end a soccer game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanna now, now, you know, go back a little bit to what Lucas said earlier in our interview, Coach Olson, and talk about the legacy of your game. Obviously, it shows how important that your soccer game is affecting the recruiting of a baseball team, the recruiting of an equestrian team. Now that, sorry, 10 years have passed. Sorry about that. I can't change that. <laughs> no, nah, it's okay. What do these two, three championships from these two coaches, what does that say about your women's soccer program, that national championship in the department as a whole? I just think it's fun that we could pave the way because it really, you know, up to that point we'd always talk, we're going to win a championship. And, and honest to God, I didn't ever believe that. You know, I would say it, I'd recruit it, and, but no one had ever done it. And I thought, you know, I don't know if it's possible here. You know, I don't know if we have enough resources. I don't know if we're in the right location. I don't know if you know, we're getting the right players. And, and so I'm not sure, truthfully, I ever believed it. And then I think once we were able to achieve that, you know, then it really – Today, I believe we could still win another one. When yeah. I say it now and I say, hey, we're going to win national championship, I truly, with all my heart, believe that it can happen because I think it can because we've proven it. And then now that equestrian and baseball have been able to do the same thing, it, it just truly shows that, you know, with the right mix of kids, you know, in the right circumstances and, and with a little bit of luck, you know, that, that anything can be achieved. And I, and I think that's fun. And, and I, I enjoyed it because my office is right up in the lobby of, of Turner Gymnasium. And, and I watched Lucas and his coaches come for years. And I heard them talking and the spiel that they would talk about, like, hey, women's soccer did it, we can do it. And I heard that for four or five years leading up to this. And I, and I would listen, I'd go, that's cool, I, I think they can. Mm-hmm. And, and, but, I, but it was always sort of, for me, it felt great because like, we paved the way a little bit and, and showed that you know, we could do it. And, and not, you know, because sometimes you just got to break the barrier and then, and then all kinds of amazing things happen. And, and you just have to have the belief. And, and then I think the college is prepared for it. And, and so I, I think that's sort of fun. Philip, I heard Coach Olson talk about resources and the college being prepared for it. Can you tell me about, you know, you're one of the you know, best equestrian coaches out there. You're a two-time a coach of the year. So why are you doing it here at Lynchburg? And what has Lynchburg kind of given back to you? to be so successful? Yeah, so I think I, and I don't know that this is, this isn't maybe the right thing to say, I don't know, but I didn't come to Lynchburg thinking Lynchburg would be where I would win a championship, right? That wasn't when I, when I took the job to come here, I, that wasn't the first thing in my head, right? So I was an assistant coach um, at Sweetbriar and I was familiar with Lynchburg. I had been around the program. I knew a little bit about it. I knew a little bit about the school. I lived in the area. Um, and so when the opportunity kind of came up, it was more of, I was excited about getting involved in something that was going to be new. So at the time, our program was in a change of facility and in a, there had then been the coaching shift. It was in the middle of COVID. There had been some, some kids had left, some kids had not come back. There was a lot kind of up in the air about the program and, and it was shifting into it sort of trying to stand on its own two feet for the first time ever in its life. It had always, our equestrian team at Lynchburg had always shared facility with either Randolph College or Sweetbriar or then Liberty. And so we had always sort of been working with another institution to try to have a team. Um, and what I think from, my, from the get-go for me getting here, I kind of looked at it as, okay, this is going to be a cool opportunity to build a program and see what it's like to start from scratch. Who knows where it's going to end up, right? We don't know what we're going to make. Are we going to be successful? Maybe. Are we not? Maybe. But it, for me, at that point in my career, was something that I wanted to do. And so when I got here, we really did not have many resources. And when I mean that, I mean, we had 16 kids on the team. We only had five horses and all the kids need a horse to ride. <laughs> um, and so the, logistically, that wasn't super easy. Um, we were sharing facilities. So we were at someone else's will in terms of when we could hold a practice and what could be just things like jumps in the ring, what could be in the ring during a practice, what could I use for an exercise. All those things are really up to somebody else. 
Um, and from the get-go, before I even took the role, I said to John Waters, the AD, I said, hey, if we ever want to really do this, we have to have our own space. It has to happen. Like, we can do this for now. I can make this work for now. But I need you to know that, like, if we ever really want to do more than just kind of have... 15 to 20 kids that like to ride horses and we go and we do what we do and that's it and they have a good time and go to college if we want anything more than that we have to have our own space the university has to buy in and i was lucky enough to be able to have that same kind of a conversation with president allison during my interview process to say hey look what do you want this to be and everybody kind of had all sort of put out into the universe hey, we do want this to be more. We do want Equestrian to be one of the teams like soccer and like baseball and like all the other programs that we have that have won conference championships and are going to try and win a national championship and are competitive and are well-known across the country. We want Equestrian to fit into what Todd has created as sort of the reputation of Lynchburg to be a championship-winning school whichever sport you pick, right? And so we had to work really hard to get the resources there. The first year we did it, we were still working out of Liberty. We did not, we had 12 horses instead of five horses, but we were still sharing space with somebody. And so we were able to do it with the more limited resources. But I do think because we did it, it, it helped us to kind of fast track how ready everybody was gonna be to make sure resources were available. And so now with the farm and with our own space, we have 38 horses that are on the property, 22 of those we use for the school and the rest are student owned horses. So we've got plenty of horses now, we've got plenty of space now, we have a facility now that we can work out of. And so we've gone from a, a, a small sort of almost homeless program to one that actually feels supported, which I think is the, the place where the university has done a great job with our program and I think tries to do what they can with everybody's programs to get us to the place that we can do it. To Todd's point, like it's not just the coaching and the kids. You have to have the resources. You have to be in the right area. You have to have the all the things to help you get there. Um, and so I think we were able to do the first one sort of as as we were working through that but i think we're now in a place where it feels like we can kind of try to repeat that or keep the standard where we want it because we have those resources that's awesome uh lucas you know we touched on the fact that you went here and you were an all-american here i just i think i'll give you the chance to try to wrap this up with more of a broad question but in the grand scheme of things when you look at division three and competitive teams and competing for national championships why is Lynchburg able to do this across the board even the teams that aren't winning national championships why is this the premier place to be playing college athletics that's a great question <laughs> I think you know when, when we start we think about like all of the the jewels and the things that are around us we talk about facilities and the resources and how important those things are and by no means do I think that they are irrelevant because they, they certainly have their place in the success of, of the program. Even the background things like the resources to go recruit and go recruit where you need to go instead of just having to find locations to save money and things like that. So I think it ultimately does start with kind of the vision that John and President Allison and then previously uh, President Guerin had set for athletics on this campus to be recognized on a national level that means a commitment. That means a commitment financially and to facilities and everything that kind of comes to it. But when you really break down and you kind of get to the core of it, it's the people. Mm -hmm. um, it's the connectedness of not only our teams that have success, but within each other and the friendships and development and just being able to feed off of each other. And I think the admiration, um, you know, I think there are programs that you talk to or buddies or coaching or you kind of get that feel of maybe there's some resentment you know with other programs because x y and z may feel like they get more or they have more success because of this or because of that um, our coaches are tremendous that is great admiration at least from myself um, of just what they're able to do whether they've accomplished a national championship or not i think we're fortunate to be around each other every day where we see that work and it's just respect and it's a connectedness that I really haven't sensed or felt from my colleagues or peers that do it other places. And when you roll that out, and they're pretty talented kids, but there's that next level of play 
because they've been pushed by another athlete or they've been pushed by their coaches or they've been pushed by a professor or whatever it might be. It's that next level kid that we have that, again, separates ourselves from, from I think, a lot of other programs and what makes you, you know, Lynchburg unique and, and, and really special, in my opinion. Awesome. Well, thanks for doing the heavy lifting there, Coach Jones. And I don't know if I was going to be able to wrap this one up, but that, that does it. That does it, I think. So, Coach Olson, Coach Jones, Coach Williamson, thanks a lot for sitting down. And thanks for, you know, putting Lynchburg on the map in, in ways, more ways than one, and being a really great asset to this college community. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Go Hornets. <laughs> Go Hornets.